Hello, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Molly Gill. I'm FAM's Vice President of Policy here at FAM. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this panel discussion about FAM's new documentary film, The Vanishing Trial. Uh, we made this film available for viewing over the weekend and uh, more than 100 people uh, decided to tune in. Um, I do want to note uh, quickly that um, I understand there were some technical difficulties with being able to access the film over the weekend and a handful of people weren't able to do that. So uh, to make sure that as many people as possible uh, who are here can see this film, uh, we have gone ahead and extended um, the, the screening um, and availability of the film until Wednesday, October 7th at 10 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance yet to get in and or you had some trouble logging in to see the film, uh, or maybe you wanna just be a repeat viewer uh, like me and go watch it again, uh, you can do that until uh, Wednesday, October 7th at 10 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, and uh, we did send an email out to everyone who registered for the film originally. So check your in, uh, email inbox. You should have gotten another email with the link to the film and a password that this time will hopefully work for you. So uh, we do apologize for those technical difficulties that a few of you had. Um, uh, we're very excited uh, to present uh, this panel today. We've got some really distinguished people with us, some very experienced people. Um, and uh, first, I just wanted to tell, for those who are maybe new to um, FAM, FAM is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1991 in Washington, DC. And uh, FAM originally stood for Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Uh, so we initially worked on repealing and reforming mandatory sentencing laws all over the country. Since then, our mission has expanded and now we work on sentencing, sentencing reform as well as prison reform. So we're just going by FAM these days. But if you've never been to our website, you can check it out at fam.org. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about why we made The Vanishing Trial. Um, we partnered to make this film with NACDL, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, uh, because over the years, what we saw at FAM was that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of stories we kept hearing about people who decided to go to trial and they ended up getting these ridiculously lengthy sentences. And they were, these sentences were exponentially longer than the sentences they had been offered in plea bargains, sometimes just a few months before. And the only real difference in the sentence length, uh, the crime hadn't changed, there weren't new facts. Um, it just seemed to be that suddenly they had decided to go to trial and now their sentences were so much, so much longer. And so we were really concerned about that. We're not the only groups that have been concerned about this. Um, Human Rights Watch put out um, a report about this practice. Uh, NACDL for years has been um, raising um, concerns about this practice. And we really do have enough data now to say conclusively that there is a trial penalty in America, that if you decide to exercise your constitutional right to go to trial, you will face a much, much longer sentence. And the only fact that uh, impacted that sentence is the fact that you went to trial. Uh, and uh, as the film talked about, you know, today we're, we're living in a criminal justice system where the only place you see a a jury trial is on TV. You have to turn on the television and watch Law and & Order these days if you wanna see a criminal trial because they're just not happening. 97% of cases are ending in guilty pleas. So today we're gonna to talk about the film uh, which shared four stories um, about the impact of the trial penalty on real people. Um, we saw from the film, if you, if you managed to catch the film, uh, four stories. Um, one uh, state case from Florida, uh, a man who ended up getting a 20 year mandatory minimum sentence when he was offered a three year plea deal for uh, firing a gun in self-defense, which was considered aggravated assault under Florida law. Uh, and then a woman who received a life sentence for a drug offense, uh, though she was offered a plea deal of 12 to 14 years. Uh, that mandatory life sentence, uh, that life sentence was mandatory, the mandatory minimum. Uh, that was a federal case. And we saw two other federal cases uh, where another drug case where a person received a mandatory life sentence uh, instead of the uh, you know, 12 to uh, 20 years that had been on the table during plea negotiations. Uh, and then we saw a white collar case uh, that was also a federal case, a, a person involved in honest services fraud, uh, who in full disclosure is FAM's uh, president, Kevin Ring. And we, you know, at FAM, we wanted to show a real cross-section of these cases. We didn't want to show um, 
uh, that just one segment of the population that this was impacting because the trial penalty is impacting everyone. It's impacting people of color, it's impacting white people, rich people, poor people, people who have a lot of resources and can afford their own attorneys, people who can't and have to rely on public defense. Um, it's impacting people who are committing all kinds of crimes. Uh, it's impacting people who are facing mandatory minimums and people who aren't. And we wanted to show the full cross section to show how widespread this problem is. Now, uh, one of the things we'll talk a little bit about today is of course the, the crisis of legitimacy that I think our criminal justice system is facing and particularly it's dis, uh, disparate impact on communities of color. So I don't wanna minimize that. We absolutely know that the criminal justice system is disproportionately impacting black and brown people. And that is true um, at the trial uh, penalty uh, level as well. Um, Black and brown people do fare worse than, than uh, white people in our criminal justice system at every part of the process. But uh, what we really wanted to emphasize in this film was that there are problems in our criminal justice system that are impacting everyone, no matter what you look like or where you live or where you're from or what you did. And we felt it was so important to highlight the, the broad scope of this problem. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into introducing our panelists today. As I said, we have a really stellar panel and I also wanna say how grateful I am for them uh, taking their time to be here today and really extend my appreciation to uh, ASU Law School's Academy for Justice, which left it the opportunity to participate in this panel and uh, help us get the word out to the students at ASU Law. So we're, um, we're really appreciative that you're participating. Uh, from ASU, we have uh, Professor Eric Luna, who is an expert on mandatory sentencing laws and criminal justice. He has been teaching and writing in this area for decades. Um, he is the founder of ASU's Academy for Justice, which seeks to take academic scholarship and make it um, relevant, applicable, accessible to people working on uh, policy, uh, to people working on improving the criminal justice system. Uh, so Eric, we're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, we also have with us Nathan Wade. Uh, Nathan is an assistant public defender with the Pima County Public Defender's Office in Arizona. So he's gonna bring us a local perspective and a state perspective, which I really wanted to do. Uh, this whole program is gonna have a bit of an Arizona focus today. And um, he's also um, on the political and legislative committee for the Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice. Um, and uh, we're so glad that you're here with us today, uh, Nathan. And we also have uh, Lillian Coppas, who is here with us today. Uh, Lillian is the president and one of the co-founders of the START Project, uh, which is a Tucson-based, Arizona-wide uh, organization that is mobilizing and engaging families um, on the criminal justice system and criminal justice reform in Arizona. Uh, Lillian's group includes uh, family members and Lillian herself has been directly impacted by Arizona's criminal justice system. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start by uh, just opening it up and asking each of the panelists to just take a minute or two to um, share with us, what was your perspective on the film? How did you react to it? Did it surprise you? Um, did it make you angry? Did it cause other feelings? What were your thoughts? And we'll go ahead and, and start with uh, Professor Luna. Well, thank you, Molly. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, the film, which was very powerful, it didn't present anything that was surprising to me, but lots uh, that were disturbing. Uh, the details of the case cases were a reminder that context should matter. Um, we saw someone with a very with a good affirmative defense in the Wyant case. We saw someone suffering from drug addiction or mental health issues. We saw a relatively low level offender caught up in a drug conspiracy. Um, we saw a woman who was dominated by her husband, kind of uh, signifying the so-called girlfriend problem uh, and the problems uh, that creates, particularly in situations of domestic abuse. And yet all of this context um, is irrelevant uh, when you deal with trial penalties pursuant to um, uh, mandatory sentences. Um, and that context should matter. Um, other things we saw in the Sandra Avery case, how important legal counsel can be and, and the fact that she didn't get good uh, defense work uh, to begin with, how that affected her case. Um, and as well, uh, she received clemency, but that's a reminder that, uh, in fact, clemency is rarely given um, around the United States and is rarely used as a, a way to deal with uh, tr uh, abusive trial penalties. And then in Kevin Ring's case, we saw 
among other things, we saw the overwhelming and unnecessary display of force as occurred in the uh, FBI raid. But we also saw that the availability of resources um, and, and good defense counsel uh, and the presence of judicial discretion, most importantly, in sentencing uh, can be outcome determinative. So I, I think the, 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 the film did a nice job of showing all aspects of the trial penalties, both before and after, and how it connects to uh, the various stages in the criminal process. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Nathan, let's turn to you. Um, you're a practitioner. What was your reaction to, to watching this film? I mean, I, I wish I could say that uh, anything that I saw in the film surprised me. Um, I could probably analogize a case that I've had to almost every one of those situations. Um, you know, I, I have had clients who chose to uh, exercise the right to trial. And I, I have one that, that went away for 11 and a half years instead of a plea to two. Um, and and um, I think what struck me um, is the importance of allowing judicial discretion um, in these situations. If we're going to write statutes, and, and once a statute is in, it's hard to change. Um, and so when I was watching the film, knowing how hard it is to roll back some of the mandatory sentencing, it, it really struck me, especially when the, the, the one judge was, was interviewed about how he knew the sentence he was handing down was, was unjust. Um, and how we've taken that power away from, from judges and given it to legislators and prosecutors. Um, so, you know, it is heartbreaking. I, I've been in that position where I have to turn to a client and know that they're going away for a long time, much longer than they, they ever deserve. Um, so it really hit home for me. Yeah, th thank you. I'm, I'm sure those are incredibly tough uh, conversations to have and heart-wrenching. Um, uh, Lillian, uh, you know, you have been personally impacted by the criminal justice system. What was, what were some of the feelings you were experiencing as you were watching uh, the vanishing trial? Oh, you need to unmute. I definitely felt identified with the with the with the film because uh, my husband was initially offered a uh, 12, 12 years for a plea bargain, which um, he rejected, and. Um, he was given 44 and a half instead. So everything that was shown in the film uh, touched my deepest fibers because that's exactly the case that we that we have in our family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lillian, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your story and um, your husband's situation and what happened to him? Because it's I think it's a good illustration of of what can happen when people decide to challenge the government. Yes, of course. Well, my husband, uh, Wes, initially was offered, like I said, a plea bargain of 12 years. Uh, and instead of uh, pleading guilty, he decided to use, to use his constitutional right of um, taking his case to a uh, trial, where he was, he was given 44 and a half, which is not similar at all with what he was initially offered at the beginning. Um, if Wes would have taken his plea, he would have been out 10 years ago. And, and how, much he, how long has he been in and how much time does he have left to serve? He's been in prison almost 20 years and he still has um, 17 more years to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll come back to you to talk a little bit about how this impacts families and including many of the families that you work with. But I wanted to just back up and touch on uh, a point that Eric raised and we've gotten a question about it, which was, Eric, you talked about how important context is. and you know, in so many of these trial penalty cases, uh, the problem is not plea bargaining. Plea bargaining itself is not evil. Um, many people want to plead guilty. It's to their advantage to plead guilty. Um, I'm sorry, could, um, Lillian, could you mute yourself? I, we caught a little background noise there. Um, thank you. Um, and, um, you know, it's in, in many cases, it is in the, in the, the person's interest to plead guilty. Um, but the problem is that we have created so many strict sentencing laws uh, that, as you said, uh, context doesn't matter. So you're pleading guilty and uh, you're, you're pleading guilty either to a, a much diminished sentence that is entirely within the prosecutor's discretion to, to give you. And then um, you decide not to plead guilty and go to trial. And, and now you're in a situation where uh, prosecute, prosecutorial discretion can determine your fate, but also judges can't. So will you talk a little bit more about uh, context and how we can create more context in, in this system? 
It's a really good question. And um, the problem, uh, to tie it into uh, mandatory minimums, um, with, in cases and in systems that don't have strict mandatory minimums, judges can ameliorate uh, the worst instances of trial penalties. Um, they are have the discretion to be able to um, uh, to, be, to be able to sentence uh, appropriately and to uh, either give a lower sentence than a prosecutor recommends, but also potentially a higher sentence than than a prosecutor recommends. Um, but with mandatory minimums, prosecutors tend to be the real sentencers, um, and it's a this transfer of authority. Um, violates the spirit, if not the letter, of um, a system of separated uh, powers and checks and balances that's so important in the United States, um, where judges have historically been the entity that determines the sentence in individual cases. Um, as the Supreme Court said once, uh, judges are supposed to consider every convicted person as an individual and every case as a unique study in the human failings that sometimes mitigate and sometimes magnify the crime and the punishment. Um, now, I need to emphasize here, and this is important, that almost to a person, prosecutors are decent, hardworking public servants, and they enter the profession to do good. Um, and I want to encourage my students who are listening in to become prosecutors, uh, to be involved in the criminal justice system. The system can't work unless the best and brightest um, uh, become uh, defense attorneys, become prosecutors, and eventually become judges. Um, but nonetheless, prosecutors are still parties in the process. They have an interest in obtaining convictions and uh, particular sentences. And um, I'd like to read a quote. This is from a famous quote from Justice Anthony Kennedy, um, who described as misguided the transfer of sentencing discretion from judges to prosecutors who, quote unquote, are, not, are often not much older than the defendant. And here's the quote. Often these attorneys try in good faith to be fair in the exercise of discretion. The policy nonetheless gives the discretion decision to an assistant prosecutor not trained in the exercise of discretion and takes discretion from the trial judge. The trial judge is the one actor in the system most experienced with exercising discretion in a transparent, open, and reasoned way. Most of the sentencing discretion should be with the judge, not with prosecutors. Um, judges are the one neutral, nonpartisan entity in the courtroom. Uh, they are able to take, uh, take into consideration uh, the context, to take into consideration the individual facts, um, both presented by the defense and by the prosecution and they have no vested interest in the outcome of a given case. Um, but by taking this authority away, um, mandatory minimums and uh, determinate sentences undermine this, this fundamental check on law enforcement and this important tradition in the American criminal justice system and prevent judges from being able to consider all those facts and factors, all those circumstances that should be taken into consideration when determining what type of sentence an individual should receive. Thank you. Um, I should say that in full disclosure, I started off my legal career wanting to be a prosecutor um, and worked for two years uh, under the student practice rule for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office in Minneapolis. And uh, I saw things there that I will never forget and um, remember doing plea deals in the hallway. And uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, is is so dangerous, I think, about the, the plea process um, and, and uh, also the the trial penalty is that these these deals are happening behind closed doors. Uh, they're not on the record. There's not a judge there looking over everybody's shoulders, trying to make sure people are being fair um, or people are even being reasonable. Um, you know, we would cut plea deals out in hallways, and basically it was I will bring you uh, a number of years, and uh, you you know if you want to resolve this quick, quickly, here's my offer, and if you don't take it well, the consequences will get a lot steeper for you. I can bring more charges against you, uh, which is easy to do because we have this big sprawling criminal code. I can make sure I charge you with something that has a mandatory minimum sentence, which isn't hard to do because we have a lot of mandatory sentences in our laws. And I was always astonished by the, uh, the sort of uh, lack of humility that I often saw in this process and uh, sort of this this sense of machinery that this was just another person, you know, rolling along the conveyor belts, and uh, you know, there there wasn't a lot of humility about the fact that we're thinking about this is someone's life. There's a whole family attached to this person. There's a whole community attached to this person, and and what are we doing here? And um, 
it was one of the reasons that I decided not to be a prosecutor and mandatory sentencing watching that happen was one of the reasons I decided to uh, chuck it all and move to Washington DC and become an advocate for reform. So, um, you know, Nate, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Arizona specifically because Arizona has a very unique sentencing structure that I think shows that it's not prosecutors or judges or defenders who are evil or uh, wicked. Uh, we have built a system that encourages and enables bad outcomes and encourages and enables coercion. So why don't you talk about how Arizona's laws work? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that um, Arizona has one of the strictest mandatory minimum uh, statutory schemes in the country, if not now that some other states have reformed, we may have the harshest. Um, so a lot of the coercion is not behind the scenes, it's set up right up front. Um, your, your sentencing range is based on the level of felony that you have and the number of priors that you have. And if you bear with me in my hope to do technology correctly, um, I will show you what I'm talking about. All right, so this is the sentencing chart in, in Arizona. Um, we have dangerous and non-dangerous offenses. And so let's talk about non-dangerous offenses. If you look at the top column, uh, anyone who has a non-dangerous first time offense is gonna be probation available. Uh, if you have one prior felony, you drop down into category two. If you have two or more, you drop into category three. I'm not gonna complicate category one, we'll just leave that. Um, so basically once you've had one bite at the apple, you are no longer probation available at all if you wanna take your case to trial. That is off the table, you lose a trial. And the other part problem is that it doesn't matter what level your, of felony your prior was. So you've got a drug possession felony up here. Your drug possession felony counts as much as if you had a sexual assault, an armed robbery, anything like that. No matter what the felony is, your penalty increases the same. Um, so there's a lack of proportionality. Um, I will tell you, up until we started doing some reform in drug laws, I knew that if I had a client that had two prior drug felony possession cases um, and they picked up a third, they would be, it's a class four felony, they would be looking at six to 15 at trial with a presumptive of 10. Um, and they would get a plea to one to 3.75. I didn't need to see the plea. I didn't need to see the discovery. I knew that was what was gonna be offered. Um, so there's a lot of coercion up front, just in the fact that no matter what happens, you are very likely going to be prison only at trial. Um, and there's no discretion in Arizona for judges to do anything about that. Um, so then you've got the enhancements and the biggest one is the dangerous offense enhancement. And so basically what this means is if you use any type of what's considered a weapon, uh, a weapon can be a car, a rock, a knife, a gun. Um, I, I've seen some crazy things. A water bottle one time uh, was considered a deadly weapon, dangerous instrument. All you have to do is display the weapon. You don't have to use it in a threatening manner if it can be seen by someone, even if it's not used in the commission of the offense, the state can enhance right up front. So even if it's your first time, if they allege dangerous nature, you're now prison only no matter what. And then what they'll do is they'll offer a non-dangerous plea. So, I mean, these are things that like I get a case, I know exactly how it's gonna plead before I even see the discovery. And to me, that's wrong. That means people aren't even looking at the discovery, looking at the case, looking at the client's history. Um, it's a factory um, and it's a coercive factory right up front. Um, and particularly in situations, and this is where socioeconomic status comes in, when you've got people in on cash bail um, that can't afford to get out, they are, there's a lot more pressure for them and their families for them to plead as quickly as possible and get things over with as quickly as possible. Um, so, so in Arizona, right off the bat, coercion is there, um, you know, and, and you're working backwards from that. So I don't, we don't really have as much of the threat. We have a little bit, but not as much of a threat of adding charges like you saw in the video, um, but everything is thrown at you right up front 
and then you hope you can work it down. Yeah, you know, Nate, you bring up some good points here um, about uh, coercion. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, there are really kinds of two different kinds of coercion. There's uh, a prison sentence versus probation. You know, no one wants to go to prison. You'd rather be on probation. So that in itself has a sort of coercive effect. Right. And, um, you know, and then you have sentence length. You know, it's better to spend one year in prison than five. Um, and so, so there's actually different ways that we can sort of see this coercion play out and the, the extremely difficult choices that, that people have to make. And, and you were talking about these enhancements as well. In, in Arizona, who has the power to bring the dangerous offender uh, designation or to say that you're a person with two priors and therefore you shouldn't get um, a probationary sentence? Uh, that's 100% the prosecutor. So and you can't appeal uh, that or? You can try to beat it at trial. Um, you know, the jury does have to find that it was dangerous nature, but all, they, all the jury has to be told is that um, you know, it was displayed, the a witness saw it, so therefore it's a dangerous nature offense. Um, the prosecutors have discretion to allege or not allege dangerous nature. Um, they have discretion to allege or not allege priors. Those come attached to the indictment. If you go to trial, they have to prove those priors or they have to prove the, the dangerous nature, but, um, you know, once, once a person's been found guilty, the odds that we're, you're going to be in a dangerous nature, uh, or the priors is is pretty slim. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have a sort of um, philosophical question that I'm going to hand over to Eric. Um, you know, talk a little bit about you know the question is why why does uh, is the trial penalty happening just because of concerns about efficiency that the, the system just can't handle it if more people go to trial and so. Let's get everybody to plead by any means necessary. And, you know, there are other places in the world uh, that don't have sort of this system of plea bargaining. Um, they, they use something a little bit different. Um, and, and there's more of a sort of settlement process, but also more, just more trials happen. So, you know, why, why do we have such a reliance on plea bargaining? And if we had more trials, what would happen to the system? Can the system take it? Yeah, it, you, you hit it on, uh, hit the nail on the head, um, Molly. It is, to a large extent, um, a matter of resources um, and the argument made, and, and it is with some reason that there just simply are, there's not enough resources to try every single case. And the follow-up to that is that uh, in order to ensure that we plea bargain the necessary number of cases, uh, to avoid um, overloading the system, we need to have extraordinarily harsh penalties that will incentivize folks to, uh, in fact, take, um, take a plea bargain. Um, but the reality is that um, it's not so clear that you need to have extraordinarily lengthy sentences in order to uh, plea bargain cases. Um, we've seen in the past that um, when you compare mandatory minimum cases to regular federal sentencing guideline cases in, in, in uh, our post-Booker world where there is some judicial discretion, that you have roughly the same, um, uh, same amount of cooperation by defendants. Um, you look at other countries, as you mentioned, there are countries where um, the, the trial, uh, the discount for, um, uh, for pleading guilty is a fraction of the sentence rather than a multiplier of the sentence. And yet those systems, uh, do result in uh, substantial numbers of uh, plea bargains um, and, and, and not overloading the system. Um, I do think that we should be concerned about the um, move, movement away from trials and towards plea bargaining. Um, the trial is, is not just simply a myth. It is an important part of our system. It's the way, it's the crucible in which um, the facts in a given case uh, are in fact determined. Um, and as you suggested, and rightly so, um, the result of plea bargaining is it's a black box for the public. It's entirely opaque. Um, it's antithetical to the idea of transparency and government decision-making. If, if we can't see what's actually happening, um, if we can't see how the process is working, if instead we have an image of, of, of uh, television as to what actually happens in the criminal justice system, we can't hold government actors responsible, both as to prosecutors and, and on the defense side. Um, and I do think it's, it's problematic. Um, in terms of, um, of the trial penalty 
undermining constitutional rights, um, whether it's the, the Fifth Amendment or the Sixth Amendment rights that we see. Um, and I, I would throw this out. How would we feel if the government was able to pressure more than nine out of every 10 people to give up their First Amendment freedom of expression or, or their Second Amendment right to bear arms? I think we would be outraged. Um, and yet um, we, as a matter of the process, allow defendants or force defendants to end up giving up their constitutional rights, as I said, in more than nine out of every 10 cases. Um, so I, I do think it's, it's, there clearly is a problem in terms of the amount of resources that are being spent. Um, one answer is to provide more resources. Uh, another answer is, is for the public to, uh, to fully understand the plea bargaining process and for it to be transparent uh, and to ensure that um, just sentences are in fact obtained uh, and that guilty, only guilty people uh, end up um, uh, pleading guilty because as the wrongful conviction movement has shown, there are innocent people who plead guilty largely because of extravagant trial penalties that they'll face if they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that we see a lot at FAM in the stories we hear is that uh, sometimes it's not that the person is 100% um, innocent, it's just that they're not 100% guilty. Uh, right. They are fine with admitting to some things, but then the government pushes them to admit to things that they can't admit to, or as we saw in, in Kevin Ring's story, uh, to testify that other people did things that they feel they're, they can't honestly say that that, that person has violated the law and, and did those things. And so um, that is something that often leads people to, to go to trial. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, lay people don't understand uh, how easy it is uh, to be convicted of certain crimes too. So in the conspiracy cases, uh, there's a real belief that I can only be held accountable for what I knew and what I did, and I can't be held accountable for everything that everyone else did. And in fact, that's not what conspiracy law says. Conspiracy law says you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. And so people who are at least partially innocent think I'm going to go to trial and assert my rights and make my case and have my day in court. And the law operates uh, to really end up treating them uh, much more harshly, and and they don't they just don't fully understand the consequences of of what they're walking into, um, you know. So I mean, we are at a, a unique moment in uh, American history, I think, with people looking at the criminal justice system in ways that uh, they never have before. I think, uh, you know, the killing of George Floyd this summer, the resulting protests. Um, you know, have really raised the profile of criminal justice reform as an issue. And I, I wanted to, you know, talk about this idea of legitimacy that, you know, a lot of people um, have known for a long period of time that the criminal justice system is not fair and it's, uh, and uh, people are experience, having different experiences and different outcomes in the criminal justice system, often dependent on race and linked to race. Um, but, you know, what does the trial penalty do to the perception of fairness in our criminal justice system and legitimacy. How does it undermine legitimacy? And uh, Professor Luna, we can start with you, but then Nate, I'd love to get your sort of perspective as to what you hear from your clients and from you know, the bar as well. Yeah, it's a really important uh, point, Molly. Um, uh, I'll, let me just give an example with regards to drug cases. Um, there is a vast racial disproportionality in drug cases. People of color are more likely um, than their white counterparts to be stopped by law enforcement, to be searched, to be arrested, to be prosecuted, to be convicted for drug crimes. Um, and drug crimes uh, carry many of the toughest mandatory minimum sentences in the nation, uh, both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, now, to be sure, there is an ongoing debate about correlation versus causation, right? That whether the disproportionate impact on, on minorities, uh, whether it's based on any number of factors other than race or ethnicity, the question, as you suggest, is really one of legitimacy. The, the relationship between uh, minority citizens and the trial penalties can have a, a profoundly harmful meaning and effect in communities of color, regardless of causation, um, that they feel and they see that what appears to be injustices, both in their own cases, but more generally in, in, uh, with regards to people in, in communities and family members who are affected by this. And uh, it goes to that, that kind of basic point that justice doesn't not only has to be done, but it has to be seen to be done. And um, that's incredibly important uh, for people who may not understand how the system works. Uh, they may not appreciate the fine lines that are drawn. They may not recognize, for example, as you said, the, the, uh, the, the powerful 
um, uh, uh, possibilities of liability through conspiracy or, or complicity law. Um, and and that, that ends up undermining um, what is the crown jewel of uh, the American legal system. Um, this, this idea that, uh, that people are treated equally under law and that justice is done. And so I think that's, it's incredibly important that people not only, uh, uh, that justice not only be done from some kind of God's eye view, but that people see that in fact, the system is just. And when they don't, it undermines all aspects of the system from law enforcement who deserve to have uh, uh, their legitimacy, um, uh, have buy-in into the legitimacy, both police and prosecutors and the court system. It undermines uh, how we look at the court system in terms of fairness. And it also undermines the, the system of sentencing and, and, and our prison system. So uh, I, I, cannot, um, uh, I cannot overstate how important this issue is uh, in, this, um, in this era of, uh, of racial reckoning that we're now uh, dealing with. Thank you, Eric. Well said. Uh, Nate, you want to chime in here about, you know, you are face to face with people going through this system. Yeah. How did they respond? Um, you know, it's it's exactly like like Eric said, it's you know, they particularly uh, my poor clients, my African American clients or clients of color, when they see that the police said this, this, and this happened, and they know that this, this, and this didn't happen, but there's no body cam, there's no, you know. The number of times, uh, you know, you've had to consider: is a jury going to believe a police officer or you? Um, Arizona has inherently racist, um, uh, like enhancements. Uh, there's a gang enhancement, so there's a list of qualities of a person that may make them more likely to be in a gang, and one of them is including just the color of clothes that they wear. Um, and if they meet two of those then the state can then present that person as, as a term that I've heard repeatedly, a gangbanger. So, you know, then the question becomes, you know, if we're gonna present this, this person with no evidence besides these two random things that they're a gangbanger, um, who's the jury gonna believe? So then you get that, you know, and my clients know this. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, the, the number of times they just give up and, it, and it's sad and, you know, and, and I get it. Like you wanna fight, you wanna push back, but I'm not the person facing that amount of time. And, um, you know, and anecdotally, I, I live kind of four blocks from the University of Arizona and three blocks from a park that is largely populated by homeless persons. And I can tell you when I walk my dogs, um, I have seen a homeless Latino man with a thirst buster leaning against a tree with four cops surrounding him just for asking him what's in his thirst buster. He hasn't done anything. Uh, meanwhile, there are U of A students, and uh, not to, I went to U of A, so not to bash U of A, but you know, they're riding their bikes across stop signs, which is why a lot of our clients get stopped. They're riding their bikes on sidewalks. Uh, I guarantee you not everybody in walking to and from the university's backpacks are completely substance-free. Um, but here we have three police officers and literally took the thirst buster away, sniffed it, smelled vodka. I mean, I watched it all happen. Um, and I see that all the time. There's a disproportionate way, disproportion to who we put into the criminal justice system, how we do it and, and why we do it. Um, I've had the same African-American Muslim client arrested for drug possession seven times by the same police officer. And every time he's arrested, it's within weeks of his last incarceration. And it's never been anything but drug possession. Um, so I, you know, I do think, I get it. My clients know that they're already at a disadvantage right off the bat. And um, some of them really want to fight hard. And some of them just say, I'll, I'll plead. If it keeps me out of prison, if it keeps me under a year, um, and, it, and it's heartbreaking. You know, Lillian, let's turn to you now. And you represent a great number of uh, people who have, are going through what you're going through. They have a loved one who's incarcerated. Um, a loved one who often uh, got a legal sentence, they, they went to trial, and and then many, many people who have loved ones who pled guilty, and they're doing less time, but they're still experiencing uh, the Arizona prison system. And you know, what do these long sentences do to families and communities? What are the challenges that they face? Well, I have a, I have found that um, in this country, it's easier to incarcerate a person for a specific le length of time than paying the cost of a fair trial. 
Um, I believe we need to evaluate the damage, damages that are caused, not only financially, but also the cost for the taxpayers um, having a person incarcerated for 10, 20, 30, or more years, along with the emotional, physical damage, um, but not only for the person, but also for the family who, who we also do the sentence with the person. Uh, we see some cases of suicide in our prisons, how many of those cases, I wonder, are caused by depression, uh, the lack of medical care, um, because most of the time, because they received a long and unfair sentences. So it's a very, very heavy burden that we need to carry along with our loved one in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you you were telling me the other day about just some of the, the costs to the family when a loved one goes to prison. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Well, um, everything we need to pay pretty much for everything when we have a loved one in prison in the first place, because they are not uh, being fed properly. We need to uh, provide for them some um, what is called in Arizona secure pack that gives them some um, sort of uh, better food than the one that they receive in the prison. We pay for the phone calls. Um, we, we usually need to put money on their books so they can purchase their own commissary there because it's uh, pretty much impossible to survive with the diet that they being, they're being served in the prison. Um, so financially, it's a very, it's a very heavy um, responsibility, um, especially for, for example, women that we are uh, facing to be the head of household once the husband is uh, absent from the house. So it, it, is, it, is very, it is very hard. For, our, for us, it's super hard, for example, during the holidays um, because we don't have our loved one at home. Um, there's always an empty space for them here. And we are, in my case, I always wonder how our life would have been if my husband would have been out 10 years ago. Well, one of the questions that came in for you, Lillian, was you decided to, to do something about this. You decided to become an advocate and start the start project, start the start project like that. Um, and, you know, someone was asking what led you to do that? And, you know, what drives you to do this? Two years ago, around two years ago, I um, was looking for some resources because my husband was having some medical issues. And uh, my first um, place to look was Facebook. So in Facebook, I got to uh, meet this wonderful people that are now uh, part of our group and we all advocate together. And, and I found out that they were facing the same problems that I was facing. So the first impression was I'm not alone even though we try sometimes not to make it public because it's not something to be proud of to have a loved one in prison, you find that you're not the only person you're facing the same challenges that other many other families are facing. So we got together and we decided to start as a, as a Facebook group where we um, felt um, the freedom of expressing ourselves, looking for some help. So when I was looking for that help for a medical issue that my husband had, I, want, I met wonderful people and we decided to do something about it. We decided to be the change that we want to see in Arizona. That's wonderful. Thank you for your work. Thank you for doing something and taking action. Um, I, I want to turn to a couple of other questions that have come in um, because they're solution focused. And one of those questions is what can county attorneys do to help us move away from the trial penalty. Um, but I want to open this up. What can every actor in the system do to move us away from the trial penalty? Uh, you know, courts, prosecutors, defenders, um, you know, there's a role for lawmakers to play here. Let's talk about what some of the solutions uh, could be. And uh, Professor Luna, we'll start with you and then we'll move over to Nate and then Lillian, I'll come to you. Um, in the end for uh, you know, some, some uh, one of the other questions was, what can families do? Um, you know, what in words of encouragement, Lillian, did you, do you have for families going through this um, in, in terms of what they can do to be helpful in, in seeing some positive change? So let's start with Professor Luna. Good question. Um, again, I wanna emphasize, and this is important, that um, law enforcement, prosecutors, police officers, as a general rule, these are good people they are trying their best to do right uh, by the public. And it, they, the problem is not the individuals, it's the system. Um, so for example, with prosecutors, we need to stop incentivizing prosecutors by tying their career prospects to case victories or to, to lengthy sentences. Um, we should have uh, 
uh, prosecutors' offices should should enact explicit, enforceable rules as to when they can pursue lengthy mandatory sentences. Um, lawmakers, we should we should um, do no harm, no new harm. We should stop enacting and um, and stop expanding mandatory minimums. Um, we should limit the scope and impact of trial penalties by um, reducing uh, mandatory sentences that are currently on the books. In addition, we, we could limit trial penalties by uh, decreasing the huge di differences between plea offers and, and trial sentences. Um, for courts, and this is going to require um, uh, legislative assistance, we could create court mechanisms that prevent unjust trial penalties. We could create so-called safety valves that allow um, uh, the courts to go be below mandatory sentences when um, certain conditions are met. Um, we could empower or revive parole commissions to evaluate uh, current or uh, prison sentences. Um, we could expand so-called compassionate release provisions that exist uh, so that they don't just apply to folks who are geriatric, that they in fact apply um, more generally. Um, as I mentioned, uh, clemency is rarely um, uh, given. Uh, we, should we could expand the use of clemency in cases of very lengthy sentences. And ultimately, um, we should think about eliminating mandatory minimum sentences. Um, it, it is a, it's problematic. Um, mandatory minimum sentences are based on the notion that you cannot give judges the discretion uh, to determine the appropriate sentences in individual cases. And I just have never bought that argument. Um, judges aren't wimps. Uh, many, if not most of them in particular jurisdictions are former prosecutors and they will dole out tough sentences in appropriate cases. Um, mandatory minimums take that possibility away. They take away the discretion. And so I think we need to reconsider um, indeterminate, excuse me, determinate sentences um, that are uh, set very high levels of mandatory minimum uh, uh, punishments um, and think twice about how we view the system working and, and, and how judges and prosecutors and law enforcement generally fit within that system. Nathan, let's hear your perspective as a, as a defender. What are some positive things you'd like to see in terms of changes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do want to re reiterate what Eric said about, um, you know, I don't think prosecutors are bad people by nature. Um, you know, or, uh, what's interesting, I think when, when, when people are given power without perspective um, and everybody is coming into their job with a different background, with a different experience. And, and, and that's why you have a judicial system. Um, you don't want to give one person all of the power right up front to make those decisions. Um, and so, you know, you know, when I look at a case and I look to see who the prosecutor is, I, you know, and I know how it's going to go and how far I'm going to be able to get, that's bothersome to me that before it ever gets to the judge, I know what, how far I'll be able to go. Um, and I think Eric, Eric's right, you know, um, the, actually to the judges I think are the most fair are former prosecutors who then get that 30,000 foot view of the system. Um, and really have that experience to, to weigh, to weigh that, that we, we talk about it all the time that the best judges that we're in front of were prosecutors. Um, but you know, if, if, if a judge is going off the rails, the whole point with, with having a judge is that I get to make my argument on behalf of my client. I get to humanize my client. I get to talk about their life and their background and how we got there. And the prosecutor can, can do you know, their presentation on why this person deserves a certain sentence or not. Um, and, and someone who's heard both sides is making that final decision. And I'll tell you, it's easy to track judicial decisions and sentences by, you know, by race, by, you know, all of these different factors, much easier than tracking it by individual prosecutor throughout the state. I mean, so for me, the judicial safety valve is a must. I mean, until we roll back mandatory minimums in Arizona, um, you know, which we've been working on and we're going to keep trying to do, um, but until then, we've got to open up this decision for judges. Um, it's the point of the system. It's why you've got, you know, the antagony between the defense and the prosecutor. There's got to be somebody that can evaluate, you know, everything. And Lillian, what would you tell uh, impacted family members uh, to do to make a difference in this system and to support some of these changes that have been discussed here, like rolling back mandatory minimum sentencing? I believe the first, state, the first step that we can take as impacted families um, who have a loved one incarcerated, we need to educate ourselves. That's the first ste step. We need to educate ourselves. We need to know, for example, how a bill is passed. If we want to be, like I said, the change that we want to be, 
we need to know how the legislator in a, st in a state works. And in order to do that, it takes education. I will invite everybody to join. Um, there's several uh, nonprofit organizations. Ours is, is called um, the START Project, and we are in um, the internet as acstartproject.org. We are also in all the platforms of uh, social media like Facebook with the same name, AC Start Project. Uh, you can find us in Instagram and also in Twitter. The first step is maybe to join social media to start experiencing how other or seeing how other families are also passing the same or experiencing the same things that you are. The first step then is educate yourself, um, go out to vote because if we do not elect the, the appropriate um, candidates in the clue positions, uh, we're not gonna be able to achieve a change in our state. So that's the main um, advice that I could give everybody. That's what I found myself doing when I was frustrated and I didn't know what else to do is uh, start to educating myself. Thank you, Lillian. And that's a great um, moment for me to do some PR around uh, a website that FAM and the Arizona Star Project uh, worked on this year, um, azjusticevoter.com. Uh, has a list of everyone running for a seat in the Arizona State Legislature, and you can click on them and see whether they responded to a survey that we sent them. We asked every candidate eight questions about criminal justice reforms that have been brought into the legislature um, uh, or proposed on ballot initiatives in the last couple of years and asked them, how would you vote on this? Do you support this idea or do you oppose it? And uh, you know, more and more people are, are responding to that and there's still a few weeks until the election. So azjusticevoter.com is a great way to become an educated voter. Um, you know, uh, we see uh, lots of one issue voters on, on all kinds of issues. Let's be one issue voters on criminal justice reform. Let's be justice voters and really find out where do the candidates stand on this. And you're right, as a person who, um, I, I work in Arizona for FAM and I go to the state capitol and I talk to lawmakers and try to convince them to do the right thing and, and uh, support reforms and uh, you know, work with people on both sides of the aisle, but um, they need to hear from voters that they care about these issues. Um, I'm here in Washington, DC. If you live in Arizona, they need to hear from you that these are, are the issues that you care about and uh, choosing who we, who we send to the Capitol to do this work is very important. And uh, you know, the election is coming and uh, mail-in that, Ballot mail-in is already starting, so um, azjusticevoter.com is the place to go if you want to get educated about Arizona candidates. Um, and even if they haven't responded uh, to our survey, that in itself is telling. We asked them to respond and they didn't, so um, you can uh, actually go onto our website and you can, there's a Twitter button that you can click uh, for a candidate who didn't respond and you can tweet, tweet at them and say, hey, why didn't you respond to this survey? I really want to know what you think about these issues. So. Um, I'm just scrolling through some more questions here. We're not going to be able to get to all of them today, um, but um, you know, one of the questions that came up was about um, public defender resources, and and this is something that we do uh, hear a fair bit about. Is people have public defenders, and they say, you know, my public defender encouraged my loved one to plead guilty too, and. You know, why, why didn't they fight harder for me? Why didn't they do more for me? So Nate, this is maybe a little bit of a hardball question for you. Sure. Um, what do you, how do you respond to that? You know, I, I, you know it's, it's interesting. Um, what I have found interesting is, um, is when I get you know, fired and um, someone hires a private attorney um, and a lot of times the person ends up taking the plea, I'll, I'll be in court and I'll happen to see it and, I'll, and they'll take the plea that I had negotiated you know, for them. No one ever says private attorneys you know, uh, force me to take this plea. Um, you know, I think when we're young attorneys, uh, I, I feel like when I was younger, I was probably a little more like, you need to take this plea, look at what you're looking at, you know. Um, and and I think it's just that kind of that fear of like, it's the first time when you're a baby attorney and you've got someone's life in your hands and you're afraid that they're going to go away for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, the more you gain experience and the more that I have gotten into the system, um, I will back my client 100%, 1,000%, you know, whatever. I, my job is to tell them the risks um, to, to find the best options possible for them. And if they want to exercise that right, we're going to go in and we're, we're going to fight. Um, and it is a scary, a scary thing. 
Um, you know, and I think we fight the perception um, on a regular basis um, of what a public defender is. Um, you know, for example, I probably spend more on clothes than anything else because I don't want my client to walk in and, and be able to be like, that's my client because he dresses like crap and he can't afford anything and doesn't care about his job. Um, you know, I've actually, some of my favorite shows, I've, I've actually tweeted TV show creators um, about the way that they've portrayed public defenders. Uh, and like, for example, Blackish is one of my favorite shows, but I tweeted Kenya Barris something fierce when he did a, a really great show on jury selection um, and race, but then the prosecutor was very polished and well-dressed, so the public defender walked in with 50 files and didn't know his client's name at trial. Um, so I feel like I do a lot of, um, of kind of fighting that perception, uh, because what I can tell you is, you know, we talked about prosecutors being passionate and, and dedicated to their jobs. I can tell you that I work with some of the most dedicated people uh, that I've ever met that really believe in the, in the work that they do. Um, so, um, so I would just encourage people, the, the biggest problem is if you're in a jurisdiction that doesn't provide equal funding to public defense and prosecutorial agencies, um, then ask why, because you've got to have equal funding for both sides, because we can only work with the resources that, that we're given, but I can tell you, you're not going to find a group of people that work harder. I hope that wasn't defensive. <laughs> Well, you, you are a defender, so you just defended the profession. And speaking of the legal profession, Eric, you know, we, I know we have a lot of um, practitioners and a lot of law students on um, uh, here today attending our panel, and some of whom are your students. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, you know if 97% of cases are resolving in pleas and not trials, what does that mean for the quality of the criminal justice bar, you know, in terms of being able to handle these cases? And, and what, is, what is the impact of that for people who wanna go into this field? Yeah, good question. Um, young lawyers uh, do not become prosecutors or, or defense attorneys for that matter because of the joy of plea bargaining. Um, and yet that's what they spend uh, much of their time doing. And uh, I would back up what, uh, what Nate just said. Um, for the adversarial system to work, there needs to be kind of a rough equality of arms, not exact, but at least similar types of funding, um, uh, given that uh, in order for the adversarial system to work, uh, you need to have uh, that competition between the prosecution story and the defense's story, um, and, uh, and to have that played out in court. Um, the problem with, as we've seen with the trial penalty, is it's, it's uh, those rights that uh, end up being the, the uh, underpinning of the defense's power, uh, the constitutional rights are so easily eliminated through this, the specter of the trial penalty um, that the constitutional guarantees no longer serve their real purpose as a, uh, a check on government power and as an assurance that uh, only the guilty are convicted and uh, receive a just sentence. Um, so that, that can be somewhat dis disheartening. But um, I want to end with a, a positive note, which is uh, I encourage my students, I encourage uh, young lawyers to become prosecutors, to become defense attorneys. Uh, I want the best and brightest to be there because if there's gonna be change, it's gonna have to be not just from the outside, but from the inside. Um, and we need people of, 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 uh, 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 who are intelligent, who have, uh, have uh, public service in their mind, are concerned about constitutional values. We need them to be in the system. So uh, even though it is can be somewhat disheartening, um, how many cases are actually uh, dealt with by plea bargain. Um, we want the best and the brightest to become uh, prosecutors. We want the best and the brightest to become defense attorneys because the stakes are so high. Um, as we saw in this, in, uh, in, as Lillian described in the case of her husband, uh, and as, as seen in this, in this, uh, in this movie, uh, The Vanishing Trial, uh, the consequences are sometimes life or death, and um, we should care. We should, we should put our best foot forward with, with, uh, uh, with the system by, by having the best and the brightest uh, serve as prosecutors and defense attorneys. I, I would echo that, you know, in my, in my short tenure in a prosecutor's office, I worked with, with some incredible attorneys on both sides, um, really devoted defenders, um, private and public, uh, really devoted prosecutors who, who had a lot of integrity and character. And um, I remember, you know, um, I think that uh, that sort of zeal uh, to get a long sentence that can be a real force, and 
I remember moments where I became too zealous when I was working on a case and another prosecutor in the office said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Look at this guy. We don't need to do this to him and, and reined me in. So those forces are real and, and people are susceptible to those. And when we create a structure of laws around them that sort of reward and encourage and uh, and make, make it easier to uh, sort of abuse that an enormous power that they're, they're given, that means that we need to also focus on systemic changes and uh, really do try to level the playing field as we talked about so much here and, and try to even the scales of power in the courtroom. Um, so Lillian, I'm gonna give you one final comment um, because I think Nate and Eric both kind of hit their, their final thoughts and one, one last thought from you and then we have to wrap it up. Um, the last message that I would like to give is that for everybody that has a loved one incarcerated, we have in common that we love someone that is suffering inside of a prison or of a jail. So we really need to be that change that we want to be. I encourage you to take action. Don't wait for others to do the job. Your loved one is suffering inside. So in order to um, do better for them, we need to be that change. So join any type of group, find any type of support that you can find. But um, there's nothing um, that makes you feel better than going to bed at night, knowing that that day you did something for your loved one in prison. Thanks, Lillian. And we are unfortunately out of time, but I wanna again thank uh, Professor Eric Luna from ASU College of Law and the Academy for Justice, Nathan Wade from the Pima County Public Defender's Office, Lillian Coppas from the Star Project, um, and um, our, our partners who worked on this film with us, uh, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. If we could not answer your question, I'm sorry, we did not have time to get to it. Um, and once again, the film is still available to view. You should have uh, if, if you signed up and you weren't able to see it the first time, you can you can get a new, there's a new link that was just emailed to you. Um, you have until October 7th at 10 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to watch the film again and recommend the film to others. Um, you know, educate someone else about this issue too. Um, you know, have a watch party. We're all in quarantine. Bring some people, you know, get get some other people to watch this with you. Share, share the share the link and um share the, that registration link. Um, we want as many people as possible to see this film and be aware of this problem. Um, and I'll final pitch um, too for azjusticevoter.com. And as you're all preparing your ballots at home, uh, we encourage you to be as educated as you can be. Um, and that website has uh, good information about where some of the candidates stand on criminal justice issues. So thank you all again for coming. Everyone have a wonderful day and uh, let's all stay well and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.